The You Can't Make This Up History Podcast. Bringing you strange but true things from the past. It's not the average history that you learned in school. We're bringing you the heroes and bringing you the fools. And stories that are just too crazy to believe. The stranger than fiction and super unique. Lawrence Bergreen, uh, welcome to the podcast. Thank you very much. Glad to be here with you. Um, I'm very glad to have you. Uh, you are uh, a writer I've followed for a while. I've, I've read some of your work on uh, Christopher Columbus. Um, you write uh, some very interesting books on adventurous uh, figures. So I'm very glad to talk to you about your most recent work. Uh, if you could, uh, you know, just tell us a little bit, uh, you know, about yourself. What's your background? Uh, well, I'm a, I'm a historian. I'm a journalist who turned into a historian. I do some lecturing and teaching on the side, but those are my two main occupations. This new book, um, uh, In Search of a Kingdom, which is about Francis Drake and Queen Elizabeth I, is actually my 11th book. It's hard to believe. Um, so I've been at this quite a while. My first book was published back in 1980. Um, recently, I published a young adult book with my daughter, Sarah, about the famous Chinese explorer named Shun Yi, who's not that well known in the West, but every school child in China knows uh, who he is. The Treasure uh, Fleet. The Treasure Fleet, exactly. And uh, that was long before Columbus, even. And I've written about Magellan uh, and um, now Drake, uh, Marco Polo, um, and some other explorers. Before that, I was a biographer writing about American subjects, but there's something about exploration which just, uh, I don't know, gets, gets my adrenaline going. The, the fact of the continuous danger, the exploration, that it's global, um, that, you know, they never know what they're heading into um, is, for me, makes it uh, ex exciting. And um, it, it's challenging because the records are often in different languages. They don't agree. Um, it's sometimes challenging to track them down, but that kind of adds to the fun as well. So, uh, so, so these days I'm mainly focusing on exploration and discovery. I have another one in mind um, after this book, but the, the Drake book I've actually had in mind for years, ever since I wrote Over the Edge of the World, which was the book about Ferdinand Magellan, who was of course as we all know, learned in school, the first person uh, to circumnavigate the world, except he didn't. He, he was killed about two thirds of the way around the world in the Philippines. He got in, in, involved in a completely unnecessary war with people who lived there and he was killed. Uh, many of his crew was killed and that just, just a uh, very small number of people actually made it all the way back to Seville, Spain, you know, where they had started three years before. So it's a it was a fascinating but tragic voyage. And yeah, I, I did not know that until I read this book, that actually that honor belongs to Sir Francis Drake, not Magellan. He, he is really the first uh, captain to complete a successful circumnavigation. You know, a handful of Magellan's crew completed it, but uh, certainly he didn't, and all the officers were killed or died along the way. Uh, Drake was, uh, well, first of all, he had the benefit of uh, Magellan's circumnavigation, which was 60 some years before, and he had maps um, and he had the benefit of, ex of his ex of, of learning from Magellan's mistakes, and there were many of them. Um, he was also an incredibly good sailor. It goes without saying. He, he had gone to sea at a young age. He was from Devon in England, which is a beautiful part of England and uh, you know near the ocean, and uh, he was the oldest of 12. Uh, many of his siblings also went to sea. Many of them died at sea. So it was a very hazardous uh, occupation. Uh, but, but Drake was very skillful uh, and uh, very not particularly well educated, but um, he was quite religious uh, and a very disciplined sailor. And he was also cautious. I was struck by the fact that this, this bold, daring, red-haired uh, pirate um, also was very interested in protecting his own life. He was not reckless. Uh, he often stayed offshore because being on shore could be pose all sorts of hazards, uh, both from the uh, terrain and from the people there. Um, he uh, 
he was known for raiding Spanish settlements around the world for gold. Uh, these were surgical strikes. Um, he would go in by surprise, get all the gold he needed, and leave. He didn't. Uh, he wasn't really into uh, genocide. Quite the opposite. He was actually appalled by that. Uh, at or I should say, became eventually became appalled by it. Um, and you have to understand, this is a different era in the 16th century. Uh, you know, Drake was born in 1540. And it's, it's, it doesn't make a lot of sense to judge them by our standards. By our standards, they were barbarians, um, including Queen Elizabeth. They, you know, killed people at the drop of a hat. They, they were sword fighting. Life was uncertain. People died, you know, of all sorts of diseases at a, at a young age. So it was, you know, the whole... Um, assumptions uh, underlying uh, people's existences were, were different. Uh, Drake was also very religious and uh, he really believed fervently his, in God. His father who had been a uh, farmer eventually became a clergyman and it was very important that he was a Protestant because England at that time was torn between Protestants and Catholics as a result of uh, the Reformation and King Henry's um, starting the Church of England uh, so he could get divorced and remarried. And so you had, uh, you know, two groups in England who were very hostile to each other, a country that was on the verge of disuniting at, at almost any time. Uh, and it was a difficult place. It was also in Drake's era among the poorer nations in Europe. We're, we're thinking, we think of England as at that time of being a uh, thriving, prosperous empire, but it wasn't until Drake came along. He had, a, he had a significant role in in making it that way, but it was actually quite poor. Uh, they were known for, for starving. Uh, Spain was the big power in, in Europe at that point. They were the big bopper. Um, they had a huge empire that was almost global, um, and uh, England was afraid of being uh, invaded by Spain at any time. King Philip um, was, was an avowed enemy. Of course, he was Catholic, and that was, he had an alliance with the Catholic Church and other Catholic countries, and England felt uh, really outnumbered and isolated. They had had one tiny colony uh, in Calais, uh, on the French coast, but they lost that. So they, they were just an island nation, and it looked like, you know, if you had to predict at that point that they would be overrun by Spain and become annexed by the Spanish Empire. However, a couple of things changed that. First of all, through a quirk of an accident of, of fate, Elizabeth became Queen of England. She was not, she was, keep in mind, she was the daughter of Henry VIII, you know, with the six wives. Her mother was Anne Boleyn, who was one of his wives whom he had beheaded. So imagine having these two people as your parents. She <laughs> was out of the line of succession. Uh, it looked like She's her. the last person that anyone would have expected to be. And Right, and, and she grew up kind of in confinement. Uh, she was pretty well educated. Uh, she knew Latin very well. Um, she was highly intelligent. Uh, and she had much more education than women did at that time. And uh, so in a sense, this confinement, uh, while dreary, worked for her because it helped her, it gave her some uh, serenity to be educated and kept her out of harm's way. Uh, it looked like uh, queen Mary was going to be the queen of England. She was, a, of course, Catholic. That would have changed the course of uh, European history, uh, but she died. And then, so quite by accident, Elizabeth found herself as the Protestant queen. Well, she embraced her Protestantism very carefully, and her displays of uh, piety uh, religious services were closely modeled on uh, the Catholic model, uh, model. So if you were to observe them at a distance, you you would say, what's the difference? Uh, but to, to the English, you know, there was a big difference and it, it, it mattered a lot. So she didn't seem too Protestant to us, you know, today, if we were to, you know, see what she was doing, but but it was, it was a big deal. And of course, Drake was a Protestant. If Drake had been Catholic, we wouldn't have heard of him. She, she made alliances with Protestants. Her ministers were all Protestant. Uh, one of her most important, Francis Walsingham, was uh, who invented or developed the British Secret Service, was a Puritan, which meant he was sort of more Protestant than thou, if you will. 
and, and she often surrounded herself with people who were very pious and dedicated to her service. So she selected those who advised her uh, very carefully. Um, there's been a lot of speculation about her love life because of course she was known as the Virgin Queen and, and never married. And there's a lot of theories about that. So there's a lot of rumors and ugly gossip about it in her lifetime that she was unable to marry. She had all sorts of deformities, et cetera, et cetera. The only deformity she actually had was, which was a common one, was uh, scars in her face left by a severe case of smallpox when she was young. And but that was fairly commonplace. Fairly common. Uh, she disguised it with uh, makeup and, uh, you know, she was lucky to survive it because there was no real treatment. Uh, they were sort of, uh, you know, uh, bogus cures or bogus treatments for it, but, but nothing real. And, uh, and, and although she portrayed herself as the Virgin Queen, uh, she did like men. Uh, there's a lot of rumors that Drake uh, had been her lover. I would have really enjoyed finding that out that they were intimate and all that, but that probably that, that would make for a scandalous book for sure. That would be good. That would be good. I wouldn't, but they, they were close. They certainly had a rapport after his circumnavigation. Uh, he spent a great deal of time with her, but her intimates tended to be drawn from the highest ranks of English aristocracy. And, and Drake just didn't make the cut in that respect. Uh, he was, he was too low born. Are those, uh, uh, romantic relationship? I mean, yes, they're romantic, but are they strictly so, love or is there a political strategic uh, part? I think uh, she was often caught in those, it's a good point you raised, caught in the contradictions. It seemed to me on the basis of uh, what people gossiped about it and poems she wrote about it, uh, that she did fall in love with some of these people. And uh, if she had been in a different you know, situation, would have married this one or that one. Now, the Earl of Leicester was uh, one of her constant companions and visited her, spent every, you know, many, many nights with her for years um, in her chambers. Uh, then he was succeeded by a much love, uh, younger lover um, or intimate uh, when she was older who uh, uh, mistreated her and uh, abandoned her. She was very upset about that. So I think, I think she had her... Um, you know, this uh, side that needed, you know, wanted a an intimate relationship and, you know, but, you know, it was always a problem because if she had married uh, one of the candidates uh, who, who wanted to be with her, she would have been uh, uh, instantly have compromised her power. And that was the one thing she didn't want to give up. Uh, keep in mind, you know, her, her father had uh, beheaded her mother and you know she was uh, self-preservation was was job one for Elizabeth, and she didn't want to compromise that in any way. So, you know, she would dance close to the flame, but never never actually go all the way. Um, Drake, I think, respected her limits, um, but Drake was married. He had he was married twice actually. His first wife died shortly after he completed the circumnavigation, and then he married a well-born uh, aristocratic woman. Uh, very wealthy and uh, lived with her for the rest of his life. Although even though Elizabeth gave him a big castle, which can be visited now called Buckland Abbey, which is part of the National Trust, he didn't actually spend much time in England. Um, he he would have could have lived the life of a lord because she had knighted him and he was Sir Francis Drake by then. But, you know, it didn't take long for him to go back to sea and he died at sea. So uh, it really seemed like being at sea was was in his blood. That's what he was born to do. He never really did much on land. He was mayor of Plymouth, England, uh, after he became well known as Sir Francis Drake, but actually didn't do that much as mayor. Um, you know, he's really known for his actions at sea where he was in his element. You, you uh, kind of get the sense um, that he's a person who really, he only would have been happy doing one thing in life and that that's adventuring. Yes. Um, you have you have a really great line in the in early on in the book. Um, if Francis Drake ever had a moment of self doubt, he never left a record of it. Yeah. <laughs> I never found any. <laughs> As a self doubter myself, I noticed that he he was very very confident 
in his abilities. And uh, I never saw any fear, even though he was constantly going against uh, Spanish soldiers or, you know, horrendous weather conditions or anything else that you face at sea. Uh, he was cautious. You know, it wasn't that he was totally reckless, uh, but he, um, you know, didn't really experience fear and, you know, always felt that uh, he was obeying God's will or, de or design for him. So he, he, he didn't ever seem to be ambivalent about what he was doing, whether he was on a pirate mission or uh, circumnavigating or later on uh, uh, becoming a principal figure in the Battle of the Spanish Armada, which sort of tipped the global balance. Um, he was very, very self-confident confident, and also- so shrewd, but not, not timid. No, exactly. Um, he was cagey, I think would be uh, in perhaps an accurate word. So, you know, he was interested in protecting himself and, you know, he always wanted to live to fight another day. And, uh, you know, he was all about the gold. He wanted to get gold. He was, that was his primary objective. And he got more than anybody else in England had ever gotten at that point. All of it stolen from Spain, by the way, uh, who in turn had stolen it from various peoples in Central and South America. Uh, but all the stolen gold wound up in, you know, in Drake's uh, hands. And then he brought it back to England. Um, Elizabeth was afraid that once, you know, her much more powerful rival, King Philip, heard about it, that would prompt him to invade England. Um, and if that happened, that would be a disaster. Not only would he get his hands on the gold uh, that England had, but he would get his hands on her and uh, the Spanish Inquisition, which was at its uh, most, most ruthless at that point, um, would have uh, caught her. She would have been tried. Um, she either would have been burned at the stake or tortured, and uh, it would have been a very, very ignominious end for her. So she, you know, was always afraid of getting caught up in this. Uh, one of Drake's own relatives was caught by the Spanish Inquisition, exiled to South America for many years, if not the rest of his life. And uh, it was a very, very fearsome thing. Um, very formalized. You, know, you read about these auto de fe's that uh, various figures in the Enlightenment denounced. But, you know, this was their uh, this was their high point, and it was uh, conducted by Spain uh, and and the Catholic Church, um, you know, supposedly uh, to bring or enforce uh, Catholic influence or Catholic rule to various countries. But you know, in practice, it was so ruthless. It was it was really just a, a power play. It was a way of terrorizing people, um, you know, which it did. Uh, not just uh, you know, not Christians of all stripes. And uh, so this included a large part of the, the world's population, uh, you know, wound up becoming the, the enemy of Spain, um, which was, you know, rather isolated in a, as a result, but also immensely uh, wealthy. And uh, well, this is something that, that um, Protestants had to worry about both, you know, the queen uh, as the leader of a Protestant um, country, and then, you know, Sir Francis Drake, should he be uh, captured, you know, at sea, um, they have to worry about becoming victims of the, the Inquisition. Uh, yes. Um, yeah, she, she really had a lot of worries. There were, I think, during her reign, at least 14 uh, recorded assassination attempts. Um, and uh, there were probably a lot more. Um, during that time, uh, gun makers, pistol makers were getting the knack of making weapons uh, smaller and smaller, which meant that they were easier to conceal, you know, in your pocket or in a purse or satchel of some sort. Uh, so that was a constant threat. Um, she dealt with it uh, the way other leaders have done by keeping on the move. She had several castles she had uh, in London, outside of London, um, and, you know, didn't spend too much time at any one place. So she was kind of a peripatetic queen. And that, that I think, may have uh, helped her survive. And, and she also had this very, very rigorous um, secret service that her uh, minister, Francis Walsingham, had set up on, on her behalf. Um, by the way, the uh, symbol for that secret service um, was, uh, it was two zeros and a line drawn across the top. 
um, that was Elizabethans love numerical symbols and things like that. So if you look at it now, it looks like 007. And it is thought that's where uh, um, uh, James Bond got the 007 designation, that it goes all the way back to Elizabethan times. That that was a, a cool fact I remember reading that that uh, you know because I, I yeah I'm a big James Bond fan I'm I'm waiting for the new movie to finally get released and that that's where Ian Fleming got the the 007 uh, is that coming out code number what's that curious enough I was thinking of writing a, a biography of Ian Fleming but there's already at least four or five maybe more and it seemed like enough to <laughs> on the waterfront. Uh, uh, so I didn't. And uh, anyways, it made for a very nervous and unstable country that was often on the verge of civil war. Uh, it didn't actually break out. Elizabeth was very good at juggling uh, these opposites and keeping everybody off balance. But, you know, it was not a, a happy time. We tend to think of a, or at least I did, of a robust Elizabethan England with, uh, you know, Shakespeare off writing plays and, uh, you know, various other exciting things going on. But actually it was a very difficult, and Shakespeare came along much later in her reign. Um, you know, it was a very difficult time and, uh, you know, starvation was always a possibility. And, you know, Spain, Spain was thriving. Just to give you an example, at the end of the uh, Battle of the Spanish Armada, which was in 1588, uh, England won and Spain lost. Uh, the Spanish ships that eventually made it back to Spain after being battered by storms were treated well by uh, King Philip. And uh, the men were giving their pensions and uh, salaries and, uh, and they were fed. Um, the victorious English sailors, when they got back to England, uh, were left to starve. And worse than that, uh, not only did Elizabeth, Elizabeth, who was extremely stingy, not pay their salaries, they were left to die aboard ship because diseases broke out like diphtheria and spread like wildfire and uh, killed a lot of the sailors. At one point in my book, um, I, I quote some uh, of the Admiralty speaking about how in ministers it would be uh, easier and simpler and cheaper just to let the sailors die rather than attempt to pay them off, which of course would have been the you know right thing to do and the humane thing to do. So even though they were victors, they wound up uh, you know paying this this ex extremely high price. So you know Elizabeth had this very heartless calculating side, um, and she was extremely frugal uh, because because England was so poor. So she she does um, kind of launch Drake on this circumnavigation mission um, before the Spanish Armada uh, episode, mm -hmm. uh, but you know what are it kind of ties into this this geopolitical um, state of affairs at the time with with England being this third rate European power. Yes. Um, you know what what was Drake's mission? Why did she send him out? Oh, his mission actually was basically uh, steal gold and come home. Um, he, it was not clear when he set out uh, if he was going to try and reproduce Magellan's uh, trajectory track around the world, um, how far he would go. Uh, if he had simply gone to Brazil, the coast of Brazil, and, and brought back a lot of gold, that probably would have kept the uh, people at home happy. But he wanted to go further and he had the maps, so he ventured into the Strait of Magellan, which is near the southern tip of uh, South America, and, and and kept on going. And the lure of the gold just, you know, was irresistible to him. Um, so he found more and more Spanish encampments and, you know, would raid them and pick up more gold. He was actually rather gallant in his raids. You would think that he and his men would slaughter the Spanish who were, you know, really bloodthirsty and slaughtering indigenous peoples. Uh, but he didn't. Um, he treated them with respect. He often left them some sort of trinket or memento of his, uh, quote, visit, uh, where he would raid a ship and 
and boardership. So he left a calling card. He left, yes. Uh, you know, these, these trinkets. And uh, as a result of this, he acquired an almost mythological reputation in Spain. Uh, Spain was tended to be superstitious. Actually, so was England. Uh, but in Spain, they thought that uh, Drake, whom they called the dragon, El Dracni, the dragon, uh, was all powerful. And there were legends that spread around Spain that he had a telescope that he could see all across all the seas at any time. So he could observe everybody. Uh, so he was considered, his, his reputation in Spain anyway was vastly inflated uh, because of his successful exploits. By the way, he didn't do that much damage economically to Spain. Um, he didn't really, Spain had so much gold that even though he stole a lot, you know, they had plenty left. So the, it was more of a wound to their self-image and to their vanity uh, than an economic hit. Uh, and uh, Drake, it really was in some ways just, just an annoyance, except he happened to come at a time when the you know, balance of global power was beginning to tip towards England, away from Spain, and, and uh, you know, he pushed it in that, in that direction. So he was able to get some uh, some credit for it, well, even though Elizabeth was was you know, wanted to keep keep him under wraps. Uh, they didn't want to start bragging about stealing a lot of gold from Spain and then provoking uh, Spanish soldiers to overrun England, which the countries are close together could have happened well, very easily. State sponsoring piracy, right? right. I mean, doesn't so want that to get she, out. She kept her role. Um, semi-secret and she was part of a syndicate that uh, was sponsoring Drake but everybody knew it was her because anytime he named it an island he called it Elizabeth and some of the smaller ships in the fleet were named Elizabeth and so you know he had when he got to uh, uh, when he got as far north as uh, California uh, he called it New Albion which is a, a antique name for England. Um, so he, he kept uh, naming things after her. So he was practically advertising the fact that she was a sponsor because it, for him it was uh, bragging and partly a way of, uh, you know, intimidating people so they wouldn't tangle with him if they knew that he was going uh, with her blessing, uh, which he was. And of course, then when he returned uh, and, you know, People heard he came back with this unbelievable fortune in gold. She she wouldn't admit to it. And people, she, gold? What gold? You know, she she uh, kept it uh, sequestered in the Tower of London, and kept everybody guessing about how much it was, and it was a huge amount. Uh, but she didn't own up to it. So the partnership between them was somewhat clandestine. And to give you an idea, she knighted him shortly after his return from the circumnavigation in 1588. And there's a number of paintings, famous ones, if your listeners will Google them, they'll, they'll, they'll see them right away, where he kneels before her and she taps him on the, soldiers, on the uh, shoulder with a, with a sword. But it didn't happen that way. Uh, she didn't really want to be seen doing that because she was afraid of Prince Philip. So she, at the last second, stepped aside and got the French ambassador to do the tapping for her. So if those pictures had been accurate, they would have showed him actually knighting Drake rather than Elizabeth. So she gave herself kind of a plausible deniability, I guess? Yeah, exactly. Yes, that's exactly how she thought. Uh, you know, any controversial action she took was often uh, you know, plausible deniability. That's true. Well, and I, I, I believe you, you also wrote that all of his... Um, uh, records and journals and everything. She sees that and put it uh, under lock and key. Yes, she did. Uh, he brought back a lot of documents from the voyage and, uh, you know, they were kept under lock and key. Uh, the famous publisher, compiler of exploration, Richard Hacklett, uh, wrote a book, Hacklett's Voyages, uh, soon after Drake's re return <laughs> to his disappointment and the astonishment of insiders who knew what he had done, he was not included uh, in this honor roll of 
great English uh, sailors and explorers. And it wasn't until the second edition came out, which was eight or nine years later, that his first ever circumnavigation uh, was finally written about. It had been a, uh, you know, an open secret un until then. And England didn't really want to fess up to it uh, because they felt it would jeopardize them. So, you know, he, even though he enjoyed her favor uh, a great deal, uh, he, he was, uh, you know, there was always something conditional about it. And he might, he thought he might, it, not without reason, fall afoul of her and wind up being jailed or even lose his life, uh, you know, trying to serve her, which happened to other uh, explorers. Um, uh, Raleigh was executed. Uh, and, uh, you know, when, when he ran afoul of the king, of, of her successor. Okay. Um, so, uh, you know, as I said, Elizabeth could be very difficult. And, and when she got older, she got, you know, more, even crankier um, or, or more volatile. And uh, so, you know, she had her own, if you, well, this is an over exaggeration. She had her own version of a reign of terror, not as terrible as Henry's, but she could terrify people or terrorize people. So what were, um, what were some of the, the, the highlights and the hardships of this, of this journey? Eventually he decides that he, I'm just going to go all the way and, and try to circumnavigate the globe. Um, what was that experience? Well, it was uh, very, very rigorous because the ship, and I've been on a life-size replica in London, anybody can go. It's tied up um, at St. Mary Overy Dock uh, in the Thames. And uh, it's small. There's really nowhere to sleep. You know, people slept, sailors slept either in bedrolls on the floor or in hammocks. If the ship was, a ship was pitching uh, in the sea, they could be thrown overboard. Most of these sailors who sailed around the world didn't know how to swim. In, you know, including Drake. It's kind of incredible when you think about it. Uh, <laughs> I feel, feel like that uh, would be a prerequisite. Yeah, yeah, but no, people just didn't swim. And, and they also didn't bathe. One of the things, just a little digression uh, with Elizabeth, uh, what, bathing was considered unhealthy. Uh, she perhaps bathed once a month. Um, others bathed once a year. And they didn't have toothbrushes, so they didn't brush their teeth. So all their teeth would blacken and rot in their heads. This includes Elizabeth. Um, and their hygiene was terrible. Uh, they wore you know, their fancy clothes and, and they had perfume sachets that were sewed into it to disguise their body odor. So they were a fragrant bunch. Uh, and uh, you know, being at sea was probably more hygienic than than being on land because, you know, hi, you know, the practices regarding hygiene were were uh, were non-existent. They sound kind of crazy to us, but you know, that's the way it was then, and uh, not not just for uh, you know ordinary people, but for you know e even Queen Elizabeth. Um, so uh, Drake, uh, you know, I think he 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 he, he liked the the vigorousness of the, the life of sea. And he also liked being challenged. I think he was much happier when he was in a, you know, in some sort of jeopardy than when everything was calm. And, you know, as I mentioned, the life uh, on land in a, in a prosperous, uh, prestigious uh, situation was just not for him. Uh, so, so the last thing I'll, I'll ask you, uh, kind of a, a fun one, you're, um, since you've written so extensively on this age of exploration, um, you know, who's, who's your favorite explorer so far? It's hard to say. Certainly Drake is the most likable. You know, if you wanted to pick somebody to have dinner with, you would want Francis Drake. Uh, because he was lively, uh, he was personable, he was funny, he had a sense of humor. Uh, you know, Columbus was door, uh, you know, utterly humorless, very pious. Uh, and uh, I don't think anybody ever thought of him as, you know, being personable. Um, and the same goes for Magellan. He was also, um, you know, a very serious person. I, 
may have had a more, you know, human side if he, you know, relaxed or something, but uh, they were not that likable. I guess the other person besides uh, Drake, um, who, who would have been a, a lively and a lot of fun and had a lot of stories, uh, was Marco Polo, because, um, you know, there's a mystique about Marco Polo. We don't really know. It's not even 100% sure he went to China, although he probably did. And he spent something like 24 years there. So he grew up uh, away from Venice, where he was from, and uh, came back a very different person. And I would have been fascinated to, you know, encounter him and, you know, see what he was like. He was, uh, I think, considered a, you know, pretty average likable person when he was younger, but as a, when he came back to Venice, when he was older, uh, he was considered uh, uh, cranky and somewhat reclusive. And, um, you know, he wasn't, he wasn't really a happy camper uh, coming back. I think also like Drake, he was much happier being a fish out of water uh, when he was in China. So he would have been fascinated. I would have really loved to hear his stories. You know, that's how, for example, the travels of Marco Polo got written. He was briefly thrown into jail when uh, his city-state of Venice lost a battle with Genoa. And as luck would have it, his cellmate, although I think this was more like a, something like a small castle that they were in, uh, was a scribe, was a uh, medieval, um, writer and poet who wrote down his adventures. And that's how we know about what Marco Polo did because he dictated it to this person, to Rem his name was Ramusio. And uh, otherwise there would have been no Marco Polo adventures at all that we would have known about. Even though many people took the same route to China, uh, other accounts of it are very, very skimpy. Uh, Marco, Marco Polo's accounts are by far the fullest even though they're they're kind of not in chronological order and it's often hard to follow what he's doing so he would have been very interesting to you know also have have dinner with i would have there would have been a million a million questions for him that's for sure well good you you always find uh you know very interesting figures to write about um uh, Lawrence, this was a, a, a lot of fun uh, to talk about. Um, the book, again, is In Search of a Kingdom, Francis Drake, Elizabeth I, and the Perilous Birth of the British Empire. Um, if people would like to pick up a copy of the book and, you know, read about Drake's adventures in full, um, uh, where can they go? Well, it's published this week, so it's should be everywhere online, you know, uh, Amazon and Barnes and Noble and other uh, books a million. And I think it's in bookstores now too. It should be in bookstores. It's published by HarperCollins. And, uh, you know, I think it's one of their main titles for the spring. So um, the, the imprint is a new one called Custom House, uh, but that's an imprint of HarperCollins. So it's, it means sort of the same thing. And uh, it's actually an imprint of William Morrow, which is an imprint of HarperCollins. Anyway, but it's HarperCollins. Okay, very good. And if uh, somebody wants to learn more about you uh, or, or some of your uh, previous work, do you, do you have a website? Uh, yes, they can just Google my name, Lawrence Bergreen, that's with a U, and they will come up with uh, my website, which has a lot of biographical information about me. Uh, interviews and pictures and things about my earlier books. And then also if they just Google my name, they'll pull up a lot of stuff. Um, some of it, not, not bad. So uh, they'll, they'll not see a lot as well. Okay. So anybody listening, I'll have a link for that down in the uh, description of this episode. You guys can link over to Lawrence's website. Um, all right, Lawrence, thank you so much for your time today. Thank you. Pleasure talking to you.